Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the online Sunday service of the Central Christian Church. We are glad to have you join us today. Last week, we kicked off a series of lessons on discipleship, what it means to follow Jesus, with a lesson from Wahi. Kim, can you tell us what you learned from last Sunday's lesson? Well, I was really impacted by Uncle Kahi's sermon as he shared how we need to partner with God's Word and remain in Him. I was also inspired to learn to be anchored in God's Word and not be like the lemmings and merely keep advancing. I was reminded that as a community, we should help one another to stay convicted and to learn to love God's Word. Indeed, last Sunday lessons remind us of who we are. As disciples of Jesus, we need to remain in Him, to love His Word, and to be anchored in His Word. I'm excited to be learning and growing in my own discipleship, and I hope we all can grow together in this area. At this moment, I'm going to be leading us in prayer. If you can, I'd like to encourage us to get out on our knees out of reverence for God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time that we can worship you. Even though we can't meet physically amid this pandemic, yet we are excited that at this moment, there are thousands of us worshipping you in spirit and in heart. Help us to grow closer to you each day. Help us to understand what it means to follow you and to live the kind of life that glorify you. Today, as we worship you, through our praises, help us to put aside all the different challenges that we face and to give you undivided attention through our worship. We pray that you can be with us as we listen to the preaching by our brother Anthony Chan. May the preaching convict us and help us to grow in our discipleship. Father, lastly, we pray that you can protect all of us to stay safe during this pandemic. We pray that vaccine can be found very soon and life can go back to normal again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our song leaders will now lead us in worship. Okay, now we'll be singing All in All. Rising again, I bless your name. 
Now we'll be singing Encourage My Soul. to God, the morning light appears, encourage my soul, and let us journey on, for the night is dark, and I am far from home, thanks be to God, the morning the storm is passing over Don't you know? The storm is passing over The storm is passing over Hallelujah The storm is passing over Don't you know? The storm is passing over storm is passing over, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. The storm is passing over, don't you know? The storm is passing over, the storm is passing over. Before we sing a new song titled, There is None Like You, sent by Tasha, let's read a verse from Hebrew chapter 12, verse 28 to 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. 
This passage says that those who follow Christ are part of this unshakable kingdom. And they will withstand the shaking, shifting, and burning. You know, when we feel unsure about the future, we can draw our confidence from these verses. That no matter what happens here and now, our future is built on a solid foundation that cannot be destroyed. Let us meditate on this passage with a thankful heart and worship our God with reverence and awe as we listen and sing to the song, There is None Like You. For our testimony sharing today, Wei Ching will be interviewing Eliza, a campus student baptized in May this year. Let's hear her story about her journey with God. Hi, good morning, brother and sister. This week we have Eliza with us. So Eliza is a third year student from Mass Communication on Nanyang Polytechnic. She's also a second daughter of Fang Ming and Magdalene from uh, Perry Ministry. So she has her Bible study early this year and she just got baptized in the month of May. So we are here, Elisa, today about her conversion journey. Hi, Elisa. How have Hi, you Jane. been? I've been good. I've been having my internship and I'm on my final days of um, my internship. I can't wait to end. Uh, spiritually wise, I think I've been having a lot more time with God ever since my Bible study and I've been pretty consistent with my quiet times as well with my degree. Thanks for sharing that. You know, it has been such an inspiration for me to be part of your journey as a disciple, you know, and definitely knowing you, uh, you were grow up in as a kingdom kids, you know, throughout your whole life. And I heard from you before that you actually did a couple of Bible study when you were younger. Just wonder what got you restart your Bible study again and even truly made the decision to commit your life to Christ. 
I think growing up as a kingdom kid, I really had the intention of becoming a Christian one day. It was just really a matter of when. And, and I think um, I always have the mindset that I would want to start my Bible study um, during a time that I am more certain and with my desire to seek after God, which um, I didn't find for like many years. And I think that's probably the reason why um, my past few studies had, had stopped. And as for why I restarted my study, I think there was there is really quite a couple of reasons why um, I restarted but mainly it was um, during this period in my year two in poly that um, I faced this period of insecurities and um, of my worth to in the eyes of the people that I value and um, this was something that I went through without telling anybody and um, it was just me facing it and dealing it internally but I think it was it was pretty bad and got to one point that um, there was this night that it hit me very hard and um, in my sleep and I just had this very terrible dream that felt very real and um, it was like pulling me into a downward spiral and and um, I just felt like I couldn't I couldn't get out of it in my sleep and it was then that um, there was this voice that reached out to me which I would like to believe that is God's voice that um, really reminded me of my wife my and that he sent his son Jesus to die um, for me and being able to see that um, I was such a priority in God's eyes and um, how much how worthy I was to him really gave me a lot of peace and comfort and I remember waking up feeling very overwhelmed um, with peace and there was also this verse that was quoted word for word during my dream or so which is um, John 14 27 mm -hmm. which says peace I live with you and peace I give you and I do not give you as the world gives do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid and I remember just being very surprised at how um like Quote, accurately quoted it was because it was not really a verse that I was very very familiar with yeah so it was true that that I felt um, my desire to get to know God but even after that experience I was still pretty hesitant and um, I was still sitting on the fence of whether I should go and ask Wei whether I should study Bible or not and I actually told my mom like a few days later that oh if I see Wei in church I will ask her to study Bible with me but then for like a whole month, I didn't see Wei in church at all, which is pretty strange. And I remember I was just on a holiday to Genting and sitting on the bus and having my time with God. And I was just praying, um, telling God that, like, you know, it's, it's so strange that when I finally have the desire to say the Bible, but mm. like, I don't, I don't see Wei in church at all. So I was praying to God that day that um, he helped me to find a will to really like stop sitting on the fence and really go and find Wei and go up to her and so to study by way with me and the very weird part of it was when the moment I reached the hotel in Genting and I got Wi-Fi connection the first notification I received was from reaching who asked me to, to spend time soon so I really felt like that was the final confirmation from God to really start my Bible study again Thanks for sharing that Eliza. It's so amazing to see a kingdom kid who decided to take a longer journey to build her own conviction and own faith. And it's even more amazing to see that the little dream that you have is a motivator to draw you to God and to find your whole world from, on God again. So I just want to find out as a kingdom kid, what has been helpful in really helping you to, to find God, you know, and to seek God with all your heart? I think growing up as a kingdom kid and going into kids kingdom really um, set the foundation and and the grounds of um, my values in life and being taught like um, what I can do and what I cannot do according to the Bible and I think because of that like it really helped me to set um, the way I live my life and also like save me from a lot of um, sins that are irreversible and also being able to watch um, my parents as they brought me out of church um, just to see like their own faith and their own convictions and the way they live their life I think that really inspired me as well to know that um, this is the path that I would want to take one day. Wow, that's awesome. So do you encounter any obstacles through this Bible study? And how do you overcome your obstacles? I think my, my biggest obstacle during my Bible study was um, having to face and talk to the people that I struggle to forgive. Um, personally, I felt like there was 
it was pretty hard for me to to move on and um, it really took a lot of prayer and a lot of spent time with reaching and anti ng to really like talk me through and and to clear my vision to um really set sight on on what is right and um to hit me back into the right direction yeah thanks for being so honest here i can imagine that it must be so hard for you to forgive and even show love to those who have hurt you i'm very very proud of you seeing now you have already become a disciple an active member for your d group and bible talk so do you have any dream or even goal for yourself being a young christian For me, as as of now, I don't think I have um very big goals um right now. But I think personally, I just would like to be more intentional with my time with God, um, and putting in more time to discover more about the Bible, and um on my own, like besides the materials that are provided by church, and just to be able to grow in my own faith and my own convictions. And I think only then, and like when I know. Um, that I am strongly rooted, then I would plan bigger goals for myself. But um, of course, along the way, I would, I would still strive to like bring more people to church and also serve the church with my own strength. Yes, thanks for sharing that. I knew that uh, last year, actually, you brought Marcus to church and he started his Bible study and got baptized about the same time as you. So I think that you have done a very good job in evangelizing. And like what you shared, I do feel that it's true that it's so important to make sure that an earlier year of your Christian journey to really dig deep in the Bible and to really, really find root with the words of God because that will make you have a strong foundation in your further journey with God and to really bear fruit in many other areas of your life. So thank you so much, Eliza, for really sharing your conversion story with us. And I believe mm-hmm. that a lot of us get inspired by your journey and a lot of kingdom kids can even learn so much from you. I really wish you to have a great journey with God continuously and have a good week ahead. Love you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Now is the time for the sermon, after which we'll be taking communion together. As mentioned, our Sunday sermon will focus on discipleship. Last week, we hear from Hua Hi, and today, we are going to hear from Anthony. Anthony will be teaching us on how we can get discipling in the church. Brothers and sisters, let us welcome Anthony. Brothers and sisters, good morning. As you can see, we are recording from Tamasic Room today. Hopefully, this room brings you back good memories of your fellowship together with one another, the meals that we share together, the conversations that we have had, and even the activities that we participated in together. And I'm sure we are all looking forward to a time where the restrictions of meeting up can be lifted so that we can worship together once again as a body of Christ. Today, I want to talk about discipling in the body of Christ. When we read the letters of the New Testament written to the Christians, much of it addresses various needs and issues within the respective churches in the first century. There are also many passages giving instructions on the theme of discipling. Many of these passages talks about our one another relationships and how to function as a body of believers. And I believe that these passages will continue to guide our discipling in the 21st century today. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, it says, He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. In the month of July, Budi Hatono shared this scripture with us during the discipleship workshop. He reminded us that the calling is for us to admonish and to teach with the ultimate goal of presenting one another fully mature in Christ. I believe that as believers, we are called to help one another, to grow in our faith, and to stay faithful. I believe that this scripture also calls us to administer 
to the non-believers, to help many to come to the faith. As the Bible says, everyone, believers and non-believers, could eventually be presented fully mature in Christ. And I believe the main obstacle to this process of spiritual maturity is sin. My first point for today, we need discipling because we were dead in our transgressions and sins. Let's turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. It says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. The Bible says here that there was a time in our lives where we were dead in our sins. We were following the ways of this world. We were living among what causes us to be disobedient. We were gratifying the desires and the cravings of our flesh. And because of that, we were deserving of God's wrath. I'm sure we can all think back to a time before we knew Christ. The habits that we were involved in. The perspectives that we held on to and the lives that we were living. Sin is that obstacle to this process of spiritual maturity for many of us. What often stops discipling from happening is when our understanding of sin becomes inaccurate. When we start to think of sin as purely a matter of right and wrong. When we start to think of sin purely as a matter of right and wrong, it becomes natural for us to start weighing the rights and the wrongs in our lives. We live in a world today where the lines between what is right and what is wrong can be blurred. And there are times that we have to apply our human wisdom to decide for ourselves what is right. For example, we may all agree that stealing is wrong, but stealing money from the office compared to taking office stationery for my children to use at home without permission, one will seem like a lesser wrong than the other. And often, we apply our human wisdom to decide what is more right and what is more wrong. Even in our fellowship, we also apply our human wisdom and we compare among ourselves who is doing better spiritually and who is doing not as well. We may start to think that because I'm doing okay, discipling would not be my priority right now. Others who are doing spiritually worse than myself, they probably need more discipline, but not for me, because I am doing okay. Brothers and sisters, do we think like that? When we think of sin, again, purely as a matter of right and wrong, it is also, also natural for us to start thinking of ways to fix the wrongs. We live in a world today where access to information and knowledge it's convenient. All we need is an internet connection and a credit card. For example, if you want to broaden your social network, maybe you want to pick up a book like How to Make Friends and Influence People, and that could be helpful for you. If you want to have a closer relationship with your children, you might want to pick up a book like How to Talk so that your kids will listen, and that might be helpful and you're having trouble navigating through office politics, maybe the solution that you're thinking of is to pick up a book like 48 Laws of Power that will guide you through the maze 
of office politics. It makes logical sense to us that if we read more, learn more, and practice more, we can fix many of the wrongs in our lives ourselves. And therefore, we can come to the conclusion that discipling is not my priority right now because I could figure out these areas on my own. But brothers and sisters, here's the problem. We know that sin is not purely just a matter of right and wrong. Sin goes way beyond the right and wrong. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 verse 3 that all of us also lived among them at one time what makes us disobedient. Sin affects us all uniquely and equally. Our sinful tendency is a condition of the human heart that is present and natural to us. It is natural for us to be tempted to put ourselves at the center of our lives instead of putting God at the center. It is not about the amount of right and wrongs that we have done compared to the people around us. And it is not about how able we are to fix these wrongs with more rights. Sin is a part of our human condition that puts all humanity equal before God, that all of us, we have fallen short of the glory of God. And all of us, we are equally in need of God. Sin affects us all uniquely and equally, regardless of what we do and regardless of how evil we are. In the book of Ephesians, it talks about many areas of our lives where we need to take note of where sin can affect us. I know that for me, sin can come into my marriage when I place myself in the center of my marriage. There are times that I feel hurt during a disagreement and I withdraw affection to my wife or I use hurtful words on my wife. Sin has a destructive effect on my marriage. I know that sin can come into my parenting as well when I place myself at the center of my parenting. There are times that I feel inconvenient and I become impatient with my kids for the innocent mistakes that they have made. I know that sin can come into my work life as well when I place my frustrations at the center of my work life and I become unkind in my thoughts towards my colleagues. And I know that sin can even come into the body of Christ when I place myself at the center of these relationships that I have with many of the brothers and sisters. There are times that I give in to self-righteousness and I become judgmental in my thoughts towards the fellow disciples. And I need discipling in all of these areas. We remember in Genesis 4, when God was speaking to Cain, warning him that sin is crouching at the door and it desires to control you. Brothers and sisters, do you see areas in your life where sin could be crouching at your door, ready to attack your marriage, ready to spring a surprise on you at work, ready to control your purity. Brothers and sisters, sin is out there, waiting to get us. Let's not remain in an illusion that we are somehow less affected by sin. Let's not remain in a blind spot where we may not be fully aware of how sin may affect us. Let's not forget the power of sin that is ready to attack many areas of our lives. We need discipling because we were dead in our transgressions and sin. 
My second point is this. We need discipling so that the body of Christ may become mature. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 6, it says, But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. The Bible says here that despite of our sins, God's great love and rich mercy for us made us alive through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Christ on the cross conquered physical death and sin so that physical death and sin no longer has an effect on us. Christ took the punishment of our unholiness and our blemishes upon his physical body so that we could be gathered to become part of his resurrected body, a body that is to be set apart, to be holy and without blemish. When we become a part of the body of Christ, we are set apart from death, from sin, and we are set apart to be holy and to be without blemish. And we are called to help one another to remain in that way. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13, it talks about how Christ himself gave different roles within the body of Christ to different ones of us to preach, to teach, to shepherd, so that the body of Christ could be built up in faith and in knowledge. And again, becoming mature, helping us completing the process of spiritual maturity. Every single part of the body of Christ is called to participate in the process of helping one another become mature in Christ. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 to 16, we are also called to protect one another so that we are not tossed back and forth by the waves of this world to be blown here and there by false teachings and deceit that comes from the world. We are called to protect one another from falling back into old habits, old perspectives, and old patterns that we had before we knew Christ. Brothers and sisters, we need discipling so that the body of Christ may become mature, so that the body of Christ may be built up as well. Oftentimes, what stops discipling from happening is when our understanding of the body of Christ becomes inaccurate and we may start to resist having people involved in our lives. Have these questions and thoughts ever crossed your mind? Questions like, who decides who gets placed in which small groups? Who decides who gets to become a small group leader? Who decides on the topics of the sermons preached on Sundays? Who decides on certain guidelines that guide our fellowship in different areas? When we view the church in a purely humanistic manner, as an organization consisting of humans making decisions that affect other human beings, there is a lot of room for doubt and skepticism. Especially when we are living in a world today where we have seen governments, businesses, and organizations abuse their positions of power. And we can, we can become skeptical. And I'm speaking especially so as a millennial, where as a generation, we value transparency. We care about how certain decisions are made 
and why certain actions are taken. For example, when we volunteer, we want to make sure we know how we are leaving a social impact. When we find work, we want to make sure that the company that we are working for is socially responsible. And even the areas of contributing and donating our hard-earned money, we want to know where our money goes to. And we are not afraid to ask these questions. And that's a good thing because that's how we come to understanding. However, there are also times where we become too cautious and too wary of intentions. And if we are not careful, we may bring that skepticism into the body of Christ as well. And we may start to resist discipling. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, it says, And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head of over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. When you look at the brothers and sisters around you, what do you see? Do you see imperfect people making imperfect decisions, putting imperfect people and plans in your life? Or do you see a divine arrangement of imperfect people and plans in your life? Within our church, do you see only people orchestrating plans? Or do you see the divine authority of Christ being the head of the church, orchestrating plans through the Spirit, arranging each one of us in a divine manner, that each one of us serves a divine purpose in one another's life? The body of Christ will always be made up of imperfect people helping other imperfect people to be set apart from sin. Jesus' disciples weren't perfect, but them discipling one another in the body of Christ was the plan. The first century churches weren't perfect as well, but discipling one another in the body of Christ was the plan for them and for us. Brothers and sisters, when we resist being involved in discipling one another, we reject God's will for us to present one another fully mature in Christ, to be set apart from sin. When we resist being involved in discipling one another, we reject God's wisdom in appointing Christ as the head of the church to have authority over the church. When we resist being involved in discipling one another, we reject God's way of guiding the body of Christ to be set apart from sin. Brothers and sisters, we need discipling because we were dead in our transgressions and our sins. And we need discipling so that the body of Christ may become Mature. When I think about the church and discipling, I think about the assembly of the X-Men. And there are just so many parallels that we can draw from being a Christian with being chosen as an X-Men. Each one of us we will pluck from a bad place with a sad past. Maybe dysfunctional, maybe abandoned, maybe harboring hurts. Each one of us, we were placed in a community where people believe in us enough to bring us back to functionality. Each one of us brings a specific talent that contributes to the community. And each one of us continues to struggle with imperfection within ourselves and with one another. 
And yet, we were also called to continue protecting one another from the outside world where certain dangers are present. And each one of us, we continue to be part of this community that works together to make the world a better place while still bearing and embracing our own imperfections. Brothers and sisters, as we are called to disciple one another, to build one another up, and to protect one another, are there parts of the body that we are finding it hard to be completely humble and gentle with? Are there parts of the body that we are finding it especially challenging to be patient with? Are there parts of the body that we are finding it a struggle to bear with one another in love? Brothers and sisters, I want to urge you to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Just as the Bible says that there is one body and one Spirit. Just as we are all called to one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Brothers and sisters, discipling in the body of Christ. We need discipling because we were dead in our transgressions and sins. And we need discipling so that the body of Christ may become mature. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, Anthony, for teaching us discipling in the church. I appreciate what Anthony taught that as a church, we are here to protect one another from sin and also to build one another up. I'm thankful to be part of the church where I can grow in my own discipleship. You know what? Let's all take it to heart of this teaching and let's strive to grow together as a church. Right now, we will partake the communion together. Let's take a moment to prepare our heart and wine. Let's also take a moment to prepare our heart to thank Jesus for his sacrifice so that we all can be part of his church. Let's pray for the bread and wine. Let us pray. Father, thank you for sacrificing Jesus to die on the cross for our sin. Because of his death, all our sin can be forgiven and we can be part of your church. As we partake this communion, help us to remember Jesus' sacrifice. As we took the bread that symbolized his body that had been crucified on the cross, help us to remember the price he paid for us to be saved. As we drink the wine that represents his blood that was shed on the cross, help us to find strength as we continue to strive to live the life of a disciple. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We will now take out the church collection for the poor. As we take out the collection, you see a graph showing the breakdown of how our church distributes the donations we collect. On behalf of our beneficiaries, we thank you for your kind generosity.
Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you have enjoyed our worship service. Now, it's time for some announcements. If you haven't heard, the Straits Connection team is taking pre-orders for its latest Yonder magazine titled, Who Am I? Yonder is especially important today as it dares to tackle difficult but necessary questions. This time, it is all about our identity. The world is getting louder and more convincing in trying to define and label us. Who and what are we to believe in? With Yonder, your convictions and identity in Christ will be strengthened. The team hopes that everyone and every single household can own a personal copy. At just less than $10, it will be a great blessing to you and your friends. The delivery option is also available at a small cost. Pre-orders will close by next Sunday, 6 September. So order early. Church, let's support Yonder. Pre-order today through this QR code. Beside our Sunday online worship service, we also have small groups that help us to put our discipleship into practice. If you are curious about the different small group community that are available, and would like to join a small group for discussion, please scan the QR code on the screen. Fill in a simple online form as we will get back to you regarding a suitable small group that you may like to be involved in. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great week ahead 
Goodbye, stay safe, and God bless.